This year, we host the event for the second time via on an online format. I think that this format offers the considerable advantage of enabling many more of you to join us from across the EU than if the event were to take place in the manner we were used to before the COVID-19. So as a result, we have more than 300 registered participants, which demonstrates to me the clear interest in the theme of the workshop and the interest in the work that will be presented and discussed during the coming two afternoons. Conducting international events like our workshop remotely or in a hybrid format is increasingly becoming the new normal in the evolving post-pandemic world. And this brings me to the theme of this workshop, which is how the banking sector will develop following the COVID-19 pandemic. In this policy research workshop, we'll have keynote speeches and dedicated sessions to discuss topics such as the COVID-19, the wave or hopefully the not so wave coming of insolvencies and respective policy actions, financial services disruptions, competition, profitability, and pricing on climate risks. Most intermediate responses to the pandemic concern the way banks operate. We have witnessed how banks have adapted their internal procedures and technologies and established a remote work environment for their employees. They were also able to adapt their ways of doing business with their customers, and as I said, they were broadly successful in their responses. It has by now become evident that the pandemic has also fast forward technological information to transfer technological transformation towards a new normal. Reliance on digital solutions by banks and their customers has grown rapidly during the pandemic, and this trend is expected to continue. We have learned how technology can enhance banking services in terms of cost, accessibility, and convenience. However, the growing reliance on technology and digital solutions challenges operational resilience and may well have increased also operational risks. The financial sector is the second biggest target of cyber events after the health sector, with payment institutions and credit unions being the, the most affected. We now expect financial inst institutions are resolved to intensify their efforts in managing ICT security risks. In this regard, we welcome the legislative files of DORA, MIC, and Europe, which will contribute to substantially strengthen operational resilience of banks. We especially welcome intended mandates for the ABA and the sisters ESAs, supervisory authorities, about the collection of ICT risk data through harmonized incidence reporting, all concerning digital operational resilience testing and oversight of critical IC third party providers. The ABA stands ready to assume the task of Dora and Mika, my interest to us. In the responses to the pandemic, I think that supervisors acted fast to ensure that bank lending continue. Public guarantee schemes and extraordinary central bank liquidity facilities were important in this regard to assure liquidity. Regulatory action also supported those efforts. The guidelines on payment moratorium that we at the ABA introduced made it clear that payment moratorium would not automatically trigger forbearance classification, and further potential regulatory measures supported also the policy response. Now, in almost at the end of the second year into the pandemic, EU banks appear to be coping, coping well overall. They have, in most cases, been able to preserve healthy levels of capital and strong liquidity positions. There has been limited need to apply recovery and resolution frameworks. And as a result, the average core equity of one ratio now stands at 15.6% in the industry, while the average liquidity coverage ratio is above 175%. At the same time, banks continue to provide, I think, adequate lending to their customers. EU banks' loans and advances have increased by 2% since before the pandemic, and lending volumes to SMEs and households have a slightly increased in the first half of this year. Asset quality in banks' loan books has even improved slightly, likely in part due to the substantial fiscal and monetary support provided by policymakers. The NPL ratio has maintained its long-term decreasing terms throughout the pandemic and currently stands at 2.3%. The ABA 2021 EU-wide stress test provided us with confidence on banks' preparedness should the journey to a new normal be less smooth than we expect. The results show that many, but not all, I must say, banks should be able to withstand a severe economic scenario characterized by a prolonged pandemic in a lower for longer interest rate environment. While macroeconomic uncertainty persists, it's key that banks continue to be prudent when it comes to their capital distributions even though restrictions on capital distributions have been lifted. Asset quality vulnerabilities can be observed despite benign headline numbers. 
Rising volumes of NPLs can be observed for the sectors most affected by the pandemic, namely in the area of leisure and hospitality related industries. The share of stage two loans is particularly high among loans that are still under moratoria, as well as for those loans that have already exited them. The non performing loan ratio for moratoria loans is almost double that of the average of non performing loans, it's at 4.5% right now. We observe also a similar deteriorating quality of for loans under public guarantee schemes. About 18% of them are classified currently under stage two and their NPL ratio, while also still below the average, continues to, screen, to increase. Vulnerabilities are also looming in traditionally safer loan portfolios. I think that very low interest rates coupled with unusually high household savings and abundant liquidity have contributed to notable housing price increases in many member states. Exposure to commercial real estate may pose additional vulnerabilities, although banks have already increased their provisions related to these exposures substantially during 2020. As economic restrictions are being lifted, it's important for banks to differentiate between viable and non-viable companies in emerging new world normal environment. Some businesses have suffered more than others in the pandemic. Some may not be fast enough to adapt to the changing economy and others, again, may have no future because of structural changes. Therefore, banks need to be proactive in identifying struggling borrowers and non-performing exposures and address the related challenges with them. The single root book with its harmonized definition of default and forbearance should help ensure that banks set aside sufficient buffers in case financial difficulties emerge. Borrowers experiencing financial difficulties and banks should proactively work together to find the most appropriate solutions for their specific circumstances. Regulators and other authorities concerned should support banks' efforts in managing non restructuring and forbearance, as well as potential inflows of new NPLs after the pandemic. At the ABA, we are actively contributing to the Commission Action Plan on NPL from December of last year by improving data standardization to facilitate the sales of NPLs and also by helping in the functioning of secondary markets for MPLs, and by looking at the regulatory treatment of sole default assets. Currently, the EU bank profitability, despite the recovery to a return on equity of 7.5% in, sec- in the second quarter of this year, may prove too low should asset quality deteriorate and cost of risk arise. Lending margins continue to be compressed in current low interest per rate environment, and operating costs remain rather high, despite cost savings already achieved and further cost restru- restrictions seem to me that they're difficult to be accomplished. However, further expenditures are needed to meet the need for technological transformation in order to remain competitive and to strengthen operational resilience in banks. Therefore, some new prospects for profitability with seems the structural weakness of the European banking sector will be a challenge as competitive dynamics play out in the emerging new normal. New competitors, as well as effective incumbent banks, should excel on the banking market, while less successful banks, I think, should exit in an orderly manner. Consolidation could also play an important role in that process. We should be prepared to accept that such structural changes and even encourage them as regulators if they foster efficiency, financial stability, and better customer services. Now, it's a great pleasure to see our workshop close tomorrow with the final agenda item on climate change risk. The implications of climate change for the global and the EU economy, and hence for the banking sector as well, are of paramount importance. The COP26 conference that we just went through, as well as the EU's Green Deal, clearly demonstrate the importance the subject has gained at the European Union, as well as the international level. Climate change and its associated risks impact every agent in the economy. They have implications for the macroeconomy, for the industry, for households, and of course, for the financial sector. The scientific evidence provided in the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change indicates that human-induced climate change is already resulting in more extreme climate events across the globe. It also shows that significant reductions in CO2 and other greenhouse emissions are needed in the coming decades. The climate goals the EU is working towards, such as the EU's climate neutral status by 2050, of the Paris Climate Accords Agreement to limit global temperature increases to below 2 degrees Celsius will require substantial investments, and these investments cannot be shouldered by public sector funding alone. Bank financing, market financing, 
are the, and the key role played by banks in challenge savings into investments will be crucial. Continued focus and understanding of risk is paramount in ensuring banks continue to play a role in supporting the transition to this climate neutral economy. The EBA in its mandates emphasizes the need for a risk-based prudential approach when we assess this problem. Any changes in the prudential framework should be based on risk arguments, which is key to ensuring the stability of the financial system as we go forward. Therefore, a thorough understanding and disclosure of where private risks lie and in how far they are accounted for by the banking sector or the prudential framework will be key in the first instance and is at the core of our work in this area. Pricing of climate risks, I think we all agree, is an important market signal and key in providing incentives and ensuring an appropriate allocation of capital along the path towards a more sustainable economy. Fortunately, research on climate risk and prices is growing. A recent survey involving 861 finance academics, professionals, and public sector regulators and policy economies found that the respondents are at least 20 times more likely to believe that climate risk is currently being underestimated by asset markets as opposed to overestimated. So therefore, it will be crucial to continue research efforts and exchange views on this topic. And in that context, I am delighted to see three papers in this workshop that analyze the reflection of climate risk in the pricing of specific assets. I very much look forward to hearing the findings and discussion around these three papers. This is important work and highly relevant for efforts to address the challenges posed by climate change. As a final remark, if I may, I would like to highlight that continuous dialogue between the industry, supervisors, regulators, and other stakeholders it's very important for our shared goal of making the emerging new normal to be most beneficial for financial institutions and consumers alike, while mitigating the risk involved effectively. This brings me to the importance of events such as our policy research workshop that we're having today and tomorrow. We hope it will be valuable to you all to share ideas away from the immediate pressing aims of policy and supervision. I can assure you that events like ours today are immensely valuable in bringing together different perspectives and stimulating a policy debate when we contribute to shape the new normal in the banking sector. I am sure we all look forward to an interactive and lively discussion of the excellent papers which will be presented over these two afternoons. I conclude first by thanking all of you who have contributed papers to this workshop, by thanking our two keynote speakers, and also especially thanking the ABA colleagues, colleagues that have been very involved in the organization of this event, which I would you agree has put forward an excellent program. So let me now introduce our next speaker, which is the first keynote speakers of, of the conference. And it's a real pleasure for me to be able to welcome Hyun Shong Shim. As you all know, he's the economic advisor and head of research at the BIS. After a very successful academic career at Princeton and prior to that at Oxford and the LSE in the UK. Hugh will give us a keynote speech reflecting on insolvencies and policy actions about COVID-19. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Hugh, for being with us today. Please, the floor is yours now. 